Greetings, adventurers. It's Travis, your editor, producer, sound designer, co-DM here. I have been working on this episode nonstop for the last 30-something hours and haven't slept. I am talking to you right now the best I can as a human to let you know that we have an upcoming Kickstarter for Domain of the Nameless God, The True Necromancer, and Shores of the Silver Thrum in hardcover. We're co-publishing with Nord Games, and a link to it is in the show notes uh, for letting you know when it's going to happen. If enough of you sign up early, we will add a lot of amazing things to this book, so please do sign up to be interested in this amazing upcoming release. Also, we have uh, just a few spots available left at our last d and in the Castle event this year in November, so if you have an interest in rolling the dark dice with us, please check that out. Link also in the show notes. Finally, we have some really cool new things on our Patreon, uh, including the beta for the True Necromancer class with over 20 new artists working on this book. It is amazing. It is a heck of a lot of fun. It is over 70 pages. We've expanded it. It's better. Uh, Domain will be up there shortly as well. Um, So please consider supporting us on Patreon to help us make more cool content for your enjoyment. This month, we've also added something very specific to Yara's side quest, which you can get on our Patreon page as well to see what he sees and try and decipher the handwritten notes that are very prettifully put together by K.A. Stats. So without further ado, let's get started. Keep this way. Shalis de Pace. Salis. Do you seek him? 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 Do you seek the nameless god? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago, a story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the crew and guests of the Willow's Wake had made it to the sunken bulwark, a barren rock inhabited only by the sunken faithful and the spirits of their faith. Split into two groups, the crew and guests explored the meager offerings of the island, some in search of entertainment, the others answers. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 6, Betrayal. I'm gonna go back to Vind and Yue Hai, and I'm like, hey guys, there's an elf lady sitting over there that's telling fortunes. Aji is getting his read right now. Well, I was actually thinking that because I like to collect local stories and listen to people's life without their consent, I'll grab Nimble's hand and sneak just out of sight near RJ and say, hey, come along. We both can crouch and listen together. <laughs> Great, that sounds good. Nimble, unsure of exactly what they were doing, but enthused to be included in an adventure of any kind, followed Yuahai. They sat down next to Sister Prina, unnoticed by Ajay, who didn't seem to care that Yuahai was listening in. At least not now. While this was happening, Vin stayed behind at their table, eavesdropping from afar while his eyes followed Lon as she threw back another pint with gusto. With this, I will tell you what your card conveys. Please cut the deck. Sister Prina looked at Ajay with a sincere smile. Don't be nervous. The future is set, no matter your will. Or so I believe. It was unsettling to hear, certainly, so sure she was about the path of all lives. But the card stared up at Ajay, and he had a choice to make. Glimpse fate, or choose not to believe. I do not get nervous when I have the hands of my forebears to guide me. And I'll cut the deck, take the top card, uh, or I'll I'll sort of put my hand over it and then sort of make eye contact, like, do you want me to flip this over or hand this to you? Ajay now had to roll a d52. 28. Sister Prina motioned for Ajay to flip the card over. And on the other side, an image stared back. A simple mask made of porcelain, or perhaps clay, was broken, cracked down the center. The eyes rested askew now, unable to join back together. Great care was once taken to present a false narrative, a false face to the world. 
but with each step along your path, the truth will come through, clearer and clearer. Careful, though, for not all truths are easy on the heart. RJ straightens up in the chair and... <clears throat> this is... interesting. And... I... cannot help but think there is perhaps multiple things this could apply to. There is one that I am fearful that it applies to it. <laughs> because if it does, then this journey is going to be, for some, shorter than perhaps they had planned. And as I, I think I'll stand up and then I'll turn back to sister before leaving and say, you see things. May I ask, if you were to ever see anything of me again, <laughs> I ask that you find me. I have a feeling that our paths will cross again someday. And I would like to know what it is else that you have seen. But not right now. I have been here hundreds of years, and here I will remain, as long as my bones continue to creak. You are always welcome at my table, in whatever form you take. I'll turn and walk back, sit down at the table with Vind, and I think Ajay did not touch any of the booze before, sits down, looks at the bottle of whiskey and just clamps a hand on it and... Just like knocks some back and <clears throat> as she was explaining it, since Yuehai is already discovered by RJ, and I'm just peeking out from the table and go, ooh. And then when he leaves, I look at Sister Prina, I just wink at her and say, that's one to keep. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Sister Prina smiled at Yuehai with a warm friendliness that struck Yuehai as a strange contrast to the confines of this dark and lifeless rock. She had known Sister Prina for a week now, and this aged elf soothsayer had a deep calmness she had never experienced back on the mainland. And I also turn to Nimble and just tell him, See? It's the correct thing that you followed me. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Not knowing if he actually heard any of that. <laughs> I, I'm still kind of like trying to be stealthy, so I'm looking one side to another, looking to the bar, I'm like, sorry, no, I, I didn't catch much. There's so much going on here. Yuhai remembered saying something similar when she first arrived in the sunken bulwark. It was after witnessing the misfortune of others that she'd first nervously turned down her own reading from Sister Prina. But this offered fortune still waited, biding its time before she left. A memory to take with her, if she so desired. Dear you high, young you high, would you be interested in a reading from this aged friend before you depart? I understand you'll soon be leaving with the Willow's Wake, but you are, of course, also welcome to have your fortune read. Should that be something you might like? You high weighed those words with considerable hesitation. She had shared many conversations with Sister Prina during her stay on the Sunken Bulwark, and, realizing that this might be their last time together, that this would be as fitting a goodbye as any. Smiling, Yuahai took a seat at the table. You know, um, I think that might be nice. I accept to have my fortune read. Sister Prina's expression and candor were softer than that of her last reading just moments before. A kinder smile matched her relaxed gestures as she shuffled the cards and placed them in front of a friend. She took Yuahai's hand in her own frail, cold palm. I cannot tell you if yours will be of good fortune, but I sincerely hope that it is. I squeeze her hand and nod, rolling a 35. Yuahai cut the deck and flipped the weathered card, revealing the faded image of a bullwhip tangled and knotted upon itself. Sister Prina's demeanor shifted slightly as she knitted her brow. That which you have come to rely on may not be your way forward. 
And the tasks ahead of you may require you to think in a new way. Outside of your previous life. Or your previous experience. <laughs> That's not that bad, dear. I smile back. Hmm, that is not too bad. And I think I know what it might mean. Thank you, Sister Prina. And goodbye. And I give her a warm hug. <laughs> goodbye, young Yuhai. Keep this way. Yuhai turned to rejoin the trio, her eyes sparkling with possibility. During Ajay's reading, members of the Willow's crew had arrived. While Vin Graveview, Prince of the Shade Elves, drank in bitter silence, his mind brimmed with fears and frustrations. Surely his companions would not be fooled by the wiles of a mere hedge witch. But his fears seemed confirmed as Ajay left the soothsayer visibly shaken, knocking back a sizable drink, remaining in a deep contemplative silence. What had shaken Ajay so? Would this create a break in the trust between the three men? Something that Vin's deceased brother had worked so hard to establish. Hey there, my friend. Might, might you share your experience with me? But what just happened? So, you were there for quite some time, and you seem to be, um, I guess, struck by whatever happened. Maybe something she said has inflicted this on you. Is everything okay? I have learned through my, through my time that if you are going to discover the mysteries of a place, you have to embrace some parts of it. Take our woods, for example. If you do not know the ways of the woods, you can never find your way in them. It's as simple as that. Uh, in finding my way here and trying to embrace some of its oddness, <laughs> I think I have had some suspicions confirmed, which I am not so thrilled about. Or well, perhaps on one level, I am. You see, that woman did a... Uh, I had a reading uh, of my future, and that is not something that I typically believe in, but there are a great many mysteries in my life, and this could answer a few of them, at least for me. If her troubling fortune turns out to be true, at least in the way I interpret it then, well, we will have to confront it. Ajay, do you think that perhaps she might have been trying to mess with you? Get inside your head? You're a strong leader. You've got a really great mind, and I've never seen someone get under your skin like that. Why did you let a stranger on a strange island read your fortune? You're the shaman of the Sangoma, a, a spiritual leader. You speak for the gods. You're a bridge to your people's ancestors, and... <sighs> so why did you open yourself up to such hokum? What if she's, I don't know, secretly evil? Some kind of uh, spiritual anarchist or something? We have to be like a open book. Because only if the book is open can new things be written in it. I wish to learn, as all of my ancestors have done before me. If I close myself off to these people and the ways that they communicate, then what am I? A closed book. So, that is why. Whether I choose to believe these things, that is up to me. <sighs> okay. Okay. But just remember that our people are counting on us. And I'm not saying that what she told you is untrue. I don't even know what she said. I'm just worried for my friend. She's clearly upset you, Ajay. And you just need to think things through from, from all angles before you let it affect you in such a way. Of course, Vin, and thank you. Let me tell you a little something about myself. I am loyal to the people that I love and care about, and I would do anything to make sure that they are safe and comfortable. And, if not, I would take every possible precaution to aid them, to bring justice upon our enemies, and to speak for the fallen. So, trust me, when I tell you there is nothing on this island that can stop me from achieving my goal, and helping my people. Finn smiled, clearly feeling the same way. I'm happy to hear that, Ajay. 
Oh, that is that is much. I, I see a lot of myself in you, and I'm relieved to hear that your drive to protect your people will always come first. That is why we're here, after all. So I just want to caution you against trusting anyone who claims that they can see your fate. We control our fate, and maybe the gods to some degree. But we need to work towards what we want, or it simply won't happen. I know that you have my back. And you should always remember that I've got yours. I ah. hope someone's got my back <laughs> too. <sighs> so very sneaky. Oh. Every time. <laughs> I'm sure as much as I can handle both your backs, you know, we're all in this together. And Vince, I'm sorry if my overly trusting... I know we didn't get to be all stealthy and cool on our travel so far as you probably would like. But it's all very new to me now, and I'm just excited to be with so many interesting people, no matter what the place looks like. <laughs> it excites me as well, Nimble. This adventure is shaping up to be everything I'd hoped for. Ajay and I absolutely have your back. We are on this journey together. Hello, you three. I didn't ask before, but you're with the Willow's Wake, right? I'm supposed to depart on that ship as well. Do you know how long you'll be staying at the Sunken Bulwark? I guess until our ship departs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but do you have specifics as to when that might be? Uh, the captain told us that we'll be here at least until after the retro, and that's in a few hours. You, uh, could I ask you a question? The Divining Conch and the Divining Shell Cave. Divining Shell Cave. The one from the story. Have you been there before? Oh, I, I thought the story was just made up. It's a real place, and no, I have not. I know where it is, though. It's pretty dangerous, but if it's of interest for you, I would be happy to show you where it is. It is uh, interesting to me. Yes, I. How far away is it? Might we make it back before first light? If I was to head there now. Hmm. It's only a short walk. I'm pretty sure you can manage it. So, is that where the group? That where you guys want to go, or I do not want to speak for the rest of the uh, my friends, but I am curious. About it. So it seems like we have one option here, well, at least one option that is interest of you, which is the cave. I think perhaps we could try, uh, if there is time. I would like to go to the cave before the ritual, but if that's not feasible, we could try a room here or. Some of the food, perhaps. Oh, like I said, it's quite near. This is a small series of islands, and it only takes perhaps ten, fifteen minutes to walk there. Again, I'd be glad to take you there alone, or we could all go together as a group. This honestly sounds like fun. If there are some of us who are less curious, I am fine going alone. If I understood your story correctly, then it is quite dangerous, and if. Someone were worried about getting hurt. I wouldn't want them to feel obligated to join me, or worse, get hurt. Ajay turned toward Vin, who betrayed a clearly shocked expression. Ajay, I, I said that we should move as a group, and I meant it. If you truly want to go alone, then I'll respect that. But if you think something in that cave will help you or make you feel better, I will gladly assist you in this. Please allow me to accompany you. Okay. I'll go if you go. It's settled then. As the group moved to cross the narrow passage of Sorrow's Edge, Nimble, failing a dexterity saving throw, was bumped into by a particularly large sailor who was holding three drinks in each hand. The sailor tripped over Nimble, <laughs> spilling the shattering glasses around them, and looking down at the halfling with a scowl. I, I, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Uh, I have some gold if it helps. One gold should be good enough. And I put a gold coin in his hand, and I say, I wish you and your ship safe passage. <sighs> Thank you. Lady Viviana Bloodchamber, Quinn Lan, and Deckhand Convo had accompanied the unscrupulous Round Nag crew member Harquin outside of Sorrow's Edge to finish a seedy transaction away from prying pious eyes. Out in the dim, dreary fog, with nothing but the lifeless rock in all directions, all eyes found themselves drawn toward a curious tube covered in paper that Harquin unwrapped as he spoke. Keep it cold. Keep it dry. 
The fuse is a bit short, as I mentioned. Eighteen seconds after you light it, it explodes, and the metal figure within will begin to spin and... Right, the noisemaker. Yes, this is exactly it. The secondary noisemaker will be triggered. Four gold each, and I got two of them. Wait, you said each of these things are four gold? Four gold each. I am alternatively open to barter if you have quality goods that are otherwise difficult to come across. I, I already paid you for gold, man, for like some other stuff. I can't believe you wouldn't give me like a second customer discount or anything. Mm. It's kind of rude. That's a good point. Fine. Tell you what. Three gold. Three gold each. Three gold? These are difficult to make. As I mentioned, each one has a little figure inside, so it doesn't just explode. It continues to make noise long after the initial 20, er, 18 seconds. I'm trying to think if that'll actually help me with anything. Do you guys want this noisemaker? Do you think this will help? Sure, why not? I'll buy one. I look at Harquin, and I give him the tough guy glare. And then... I take out the card from my bandana and I pass it to him while counting the few coin I have in mind. Here, combo! And I just pass him three gold without thinking about it. Thanks. The transaction was quickly concluded, and the pirate then took a glance over his shoulder. Was there anything else that interested you from my wares? Still plenty of good time to be had. What else do you have? Uh, har- uh, uh, Harquin? Well, as I said before, I have some ingestible substances. A chime that opens locks, or a rope that makes it easier to climb. Your friend was very interested in it before we spoke about the other things. Hmm. How much for the rope? Fifteen gold. It's a rare magic item. See? Fifteen gold, I whispered to Lon. You need to haggle. That is not worth 15 gold. <clears throat> Harquin pulled out a length of dirty, discolored rope which knotted itself with a simple flick of the wrist. Holy shit! That's worth at least 15 gold. You don't understand, Viviana. Come on. Did you just see that? Lon, you're drunk. Your sense of judgment has been clouded. Haggle down, haggle down. Okay, um, haggle for me then. Because you're, like, on second by discount already. Can you, like, just, like, give... Give me a break, like... Like, show me some, some... Gold, right? Please? From one noble to another? Come on, girl! Oh, I turn to Harklin. My friend here, um, Lon... Ever since she was young, she's always wanted a magical rope. But now, it seems that... Fifteen gold is a little too steep for us. Is there any way you can maybe lower the price for us, please? <sighs> so what do you have on you? Oh, I have a lot of things. Well, first of all, I can offer you the most priceless thing of all my friendship. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very tempting offer, but uh, no. <laughs> the price will still be fifteen gold. I cannot discount this item, unfortunately. Um, do you have enough gold, Viviana? If you don't, if you do, I'll pay you back. Like, when I go on later on this trip, I'll cave and actually be a part of something and sing a song on the way to make money. And I'll pay you back. I promise. Oh, yeah, Alon's a bard, isn't she? <sighs> My dad used to always make me sing in front of people, and I hated it. So, I mostly only play when it's really important. Well, when I need to use magic. That's kind of sad. But I'm actually quite good when I play. Not to hype myself up too much. Uh, let me try one more thing. I have in my inventory a deck of playing cards, right? Yes! Yes, you do. Okay, yeah, they're, they're pretty fancy. I think they're pretty... Because I'm from a rich family, you know, we used to play... Uh, card games and whatnot in the parlor and whatever the heck she has. I take out the deck of cards and I'm like, do you know what this is, Harquin? It's a deck of cards. No, no, it's not just a deck of cards. This is a one-of-a-kind special edition deck of cards from <laughs> Helendria. It is super rare and worth definitely at least 15 gold. I am willing to make a trade because I am a generous friend. Now, I will give you five gold and this deck of cards. 
for the magical rope that my friend Lon, look at her, look at her, she's practically crying. Lon, Lon, come on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Viviana. Yeah, yeah, I whispered to Lon, yeah, act really pitiful. Yeah, you're, you're, you're pitiful. <laughs> thank you. Those listening could not see the expression of pain and agony clear across Lon's face. Her hands clenched together, eyes looking up toward the sky, lantern light emphasizing her empathetic features, giving her the aspects of a suffering living saint. Viviana now required an actual deception check to lie to Harquin. Okay, but like, the cars do look fancy, so do I get like a plus one? Oh my god, these cards are ornate. They are from my grandmother's family. I rolled a 22, so... Harquin took the gold, biting yellowed teeth into his burnished reflection to confirm its validity. Convinced, he examined the cards very closely before smiling and pocketing them. He quietly handed over the rope and even threw in an extra noisemaker. Hmm, these cards do have an impressive quality to them. Oh. I'll throw in the extra noisemaker on the house. Wow, thank you so much, Harkwin. You have no idea how much this means to Lon. All her life, all she wanted was a magical rope. Now, yes. here you go. Thank you. Oh, please take good care of those deck of cards. Those cards have been passed down in my family for generations. Um, they really haven't. They're very common in the capital, and I definitely just brought them along for funsies. Okay, anyway, that's it. Harquin, convinced that the cards were somehow magical, or at worst, quite valuable, turned to re-enter Sorrow's Edge before Viviana or Lan had the opportunity to develop buyer's remorse. A pleasure doing business with you, Lady Viviana. And Lady Lan, we'll see you at the Ritual of Last Light. See you later! Thank you. Now, I have magical rope. I, w I would like to do an insight check just to see who got more ripped off out of this deal. Whether we got ripped off or whether they got ripped off. Yeah. 16. <laughs> Convo didn't know the exact value of a magical rope, but he was confident that both parties felt a sense of victory in successfully cheating the other. Perhaps none present really knew the value of anything traded that day. What those items had wrought in days long past, or what these tools could yet bring to pass. A single tear... A single tear of pride comes rolling down his left cheek <laughs> as, as this deal is being made in their favor. And he goes, Atta girl! Lon has to make an official gratitude to Lady Viviana for doing this entire thing for her. Viviana, by Celagon, I mistook you, took you for aloof. A noble who's like, not just a good for nothing, but like a useless idiot with a gorgon heart. And vampire tears was like, very high maintenance, that kind of girl. But like, here you are, negotiating for me, on my behalf. I'm so fortunate, and I'm so lucky to be your traveling companion. Thank you so, so much. I promise you I will do my best to perform on the road on our journey to earn back the money that I owe you. So, thank you. Um, I'm taking it back because I honestly just did it to fuck with the dude and see if I can get away with it. But seeing this sincere, you know, thanks makes me a little bit like, hmm, how do I respond? Because she's kind of awkward. She just kind of pats Lon on the shoulder and be like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you're welcome, or whatever. Enjoy your, enjoy your rope, I, I guess. Yeah, I guess you're okay, whatever. Though lost on an intoxicated Lan, it was clear to Convo that Viviana was flustered, unaccustomed to being the subject of such generous and yet confusing compliments. Lan just plays with the rope, like it's one of those finger traps, tying and untying her hands together. Ooh, yay, rope. <gasps> rope even tossing it into the air, creating magical knots and entangling them a bit cathartically, sobering up a little as we walk back towards Sorrel's Edge. <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate this, Viviana. It might be because I didn't have much of a childhood. Yeah, yeah. Or it might just be that I've had a lot to drink. <laughs> it's, I feel like we got scammed. It's just a rope that makes knots. But I, I assume that you're very drunk and you're just having a blast with this rope. You're like a little kid, you know? 
And I'm just looking at you like, okay, you know, maybe I did a good thing. In this peaceful moment, the dark midnight and copper-flecked form of Celie the Owl landed on Viviana's shoulder, as if to acknowledge her swindled victory. The small leg of a dark bat was plainly visible in the owl's beak as it stared at Viviana, maintaining eye contact while swallowing the struggling limb. I... can I try to pet Celie, like, under the chin, you know? Like a little... Viviana gently scratched the owl under the chin, her fluffy down soft to the touch. Oh my god, look at you! I... I do that little, you know, the dumb little voice people use for their pets. Oh, who's a good little bird? I'm not, I wasn't actually gonna sacrifice you. I, there's no way. I would never kill you. Look how pretty you are. I would never murder you. I would never turn you into food or chicken. You're you're a good bird. And I just, like, keep cooing and, you know, do that little under-chin pet. Silly swallowed the bat with a pleased gulp. And for a brief moment, looked genuinely cute. Convo, where's your small friend? Yeah, he is taking a massive dump right now. <laughs> uh, should we just go on without him, or what? Uh, I think he, he's gonna be fine. I'm sure he'll catch up. Yare stood himself within the claustrophobic and dry, rotted walls of the treasury. Lit only by his hooded lantern, he could not clearly discern the many objects and wares scattered about the room. What he focused on instead was a plain desk, flanked between a short wooden bookshelf and a long, retired wine shelf which now housed numerous scrolls. A not uncommon practice of filing paperwork in Yara's experience. He took a final glance around the room before his first step, and Yara caught sight of what appeared to be a figure underneath a cloth. Um, first of all, Yara's going to figure out which places he shouldn't step on just so he doesn't make too much noise while he's moving around. 17 on perception. Similarly to the rest of Sorrow's Edge, the room was constructed from driftwood and ship carcasses. This old wood creaked, groaned, and cracked as the salty air crept within, rotting it lightly from the inside. Yar concluded that his best option was to avoid moving altogether, but this would have made his time here useless. Instead, he reasoned that the points where the nails were placed might be his best option at remaining as quiet as possible. Knowing very well that time and luck both offered diminishing returns, Yare has a particular thing in mind here that he's searching for. He'll ignore any gold or riches and move as quietly and directly as possible toward the records, those scrolls kept on and around the desk taking care to only stop where the nails look most secured, and thus the board's less likely to move. He's searching for a ledger. Yave noticed that the open book and assorted paper notes currently atop the desk appeared to have the most regular use, while the other books or papers in the room had collected varying levels of dust, grime, and discoloration. With a roll of a 17, Yara found and identified a particular set of ledgers that were of interest to him. Written in a mixture of vinyl and common, these ledgers contained a record of lost vessels dating back hundreds of years. All the ships were either listed as missing, destroyed, foundered, or lost at sea. Yare was only concerned with those disappearances or losses which took place during his lifetime his finger tracing letters on the page documenting the year 340, the worst year of Yara's life. And it was on this page he found his quarry, the name of the vessel he had been compelled toward, drawn toward, a singular clue after years of searching. The Nimble Lark. The Nimble Lark. Just seeing the name again, knowing it was real. Yara paused, horrified, stunned, and was briefly lost within his own thoughts. As stress mounted, he let it go with a tense sigh, the weight of that terrible day expelling a subconscious ripple which caused the page before him to shiver. Yara stared at the ledger, took a deep breath, and debated if he had more time to simply copy the information. With a quivering hand, he'll simply rip out the page, pocket it, and scour the rest for information that might be useful. Can I determine who took the notes within the ledger? There don't appear to be any names in the handout beyond the names of the ships, the location of construction, last known location, and the cause of loss. 
very nice handwriting, by the way. Yare might have known something. With a knowledge religion check. Fifteen. Yare recalled hearing that temple ledgers were filled out by a variety of literate sunken priests, the duty changing hands every several years. This book, it seemed, saw shifts in handwriting every three or five decades as a new faithful took to the job. Some recent pages, including the one he'd stolen, had entries written in the same hand until only five years ago, when it shifted from the high arches of a banker's handwriting to the more looping, winding characters of a more feminine hand, which became more relaxed with each passing year. Well, sensing that I've probably already spent too much time up here and don't want to get caught up in some kind of Insmith situation, Yara's going to do one final scan of the room for anything else of interest before carefully planning his path back to the hatch. Yara's mind began to relax. He had found the thing he'd come for, a potential key to uncovering more about his haunted past, and now he could focus elsewhere. His eyes began to see the room for what it really was, a treasury. He found himself among riches that would make less honest sailors blush, quickly taking inventory and making offhand appraisals of the more interesting items in his mind. Aside from gems, gold, and silver, which he ignored, he was drawn to examine a set of copper fleece mittens, a small rod, a cylinder carved with lily and fish motifs currently working as a paperweight, a glass vial innocuously sitting atop the desk, daring him to drink it and find out, a small idol of platinum or silver that he'd unconsciously set aside to review the ledger. No, definitely platinum, and perhaps sharp tusk ivory. An idol of Silopos, the beloved serpent saint of the sunken one. Its sapphire eyes worth more than ten years' pay, but surely he was no thief, right? Yara spied a small golden sphere bearing the iconography of Seligon, the Lord of Light, and covered in curious runes. Yara, being a believer, or perhaps believer adjacent, was intrigued by this, and while he would not openly call himself a religious man, he felt a very real hesitation at the thought that this object might be sacrificed, cast into the sea, and so he lifted it. The sphere rattled, however, and strangely enough, it felt as though something were inside. That is something he's going to investigate at a later point. With a 16 for religion, Yare, he identifies the trinket as a Seligon puzzle sphere. The Morning Lord is also the god of logic and owls, and he's known to be quite fond of puzzles. But I do wonder what's inside. Later. And Yara's going to have more than a few things to do in his downtime now once he gets back to the ship. Pocketing it, he starts out of the treasury. One last roll was required. A stealth check to leave the room unnoticed. Oh, on a 14, that's a 16. And unfortunately, Yara's timing with the hatch was poor, and the young dwarf below had no difficulty looking up, shocked to see Yara emerge from the locked treasury, anger playing across his face. How did you get up there? I was I was told to go looking for the outhouse back here. I, I've been to other places where they lock the doors to the outhouses, but <laughs> this one has the lock on the wrong side, and it was open. So I just thought... Sir, sir, sir. Be it stone houses or wood, outhouses are never up. Well, I've been told that they do in Alandria, and this place seems pretty progressive. I... Figured you'd have a hole that maybe leans over the edge or something. Yara would require a deception check. Oh, it's a plus five to a 13. That makes 18. Okay, sir. Let's say I believe you. How'd you get Just then, the door behind Brother Skandar opened as first mate Av Mitoff and deckhand Yelena from the Willow's Wake appeared. Oh, there you are, Yara. We've been looking for you. Uh, Av? Um, Come on, Yaro, we got something we need to help lift in and maybe a bit of fixing. Uh, this way, last gates. Looking for the outhouse, but yes, that I guess that can wait. And he does a clenching impression. His, his face looks very... But he helps Av carry whatever needs carrying. Drunk. The many riches in plain sight that Yara had simply ignored seemed to lend credence to his lie. And as Yara and his accomplices left Sorrow's Edge toward the temple, the young sunken brother began to investigate the lock for faults while lashing the rope he was using as a belt to the door to keep it firmly closed. So 
What are we moving? Looked like you were in a bit of a pinch there. I thought it best to get you out of there. Alice good? Everything's good. Now. Combo, where's your small friend? Yeah, he is taking a massive dump right now. <laughs> Should we just go on without him or what? Uh, I think he, he's gonna be fine. I'm sure he'll catch up. And at that moment, Yara, as if on command, tells Arf he'll meet up with the rest of the crew in a moment and appears in that thick fog with a very pleased grin on his face. How's your stomach feeling, buddy? Tough day, huh? Uh, yes. Uh, I can assure you that my stomach is fine now. Thank you. You drink like a boy. You drink like a little boy so much. I cannot believe that you have such a beard that nice for being such a well played. Yara nervously scratched his beard as he made eye contact with Seely, trying to determine the best way to redirect the conversation. Don't worry, alcohol gives me constipation too. He's he's going to give Seely a nod that the other is well, maybe Canvo, but the others can't really interpret, but Seely will know that he he's achieved the thing. He, well, part of what he wanted to do. From my perspective, it looks like you came back after taking a poop, and then you looked at your owl and nodded, like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, well, he's a very interesting guy. Um, you know, whatever floats your boat. Vaughn continues playing with the rope. Uh, I'm glad that your bow movement was without complication. But Yara is looking very relieved, so easy mistake to make. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, I, I buy it, I buy it. Yeah. Um, totally. He, he, uh, I, I, I kind of, I kind of whispered to Vienna. He's been a little backed up since uh, Ember God. <laughs> and I whispered back, you know what? To be quite honest with you, so have I. Do you, do you need to go to the outhouse? Oh no, no, I'm, I'm really, I'm kind of constipated right now. I'm actually too anxious to go to the outhouse because I feel like Fluffy's going to die. You know, that's very reasonable. A very reasonable reason to feel anxious. Let's just go to the sunken temple before we get a chance to get into too much trouble with that rope. Yes, uh, Av and Yelena are waiting for us over there, uh, just before the tide way. Earlier that day, that very short, dark day, Aje, Nimble, Vind, and Yuahai had set off to explore the bulwark, specifically a cave legend to be the location of the mythical diviner conch. As they traveled through the thick fog across rocks gray and sharp, under a light, chilling rain, a priest appeared, climbing up from the edge of a cliff. His back was overburdened by a simple pack full of seaweed, and he took a moment to warn the team of the dangers of hidden ledges nearby before nodding and returning to his work. At this, Nimble touches the stone beneath him and says in giants, Let us not stray from our path. I give a nice smile to Nimble and I say back in giant, Let us remember that perhaps not everyone around us can understand when we speak this tongue. It might be useful later. (laughs) (laughs) I just uh, give like a smile, like... (laughs) In in common, just yep. (laughs) (laughs) Then Graveview's keen insight caught Ajay's sideways glance. Even though he assumed some kind of joke was made, he worried over Ajay's ill intent. Vind, always self-conscious, always doubting, wondered if they might be making fun of him in a language they knew he had no experience with, but laughed with them all the same. (laughs) (laughs) I I think Ajay, for the first time, looks at you, Vind, and kind of just like, oh. (laughs) Just like, there's just like a little bit of like... Like pity or something comes across his face. Probably not an expression that Vint has seen come from him, and maybe it's a sign that things are improving between them. <laughs> I'm glad I cracked a little bit of the seal here. <laughs> nice to see you all laughing together. And while we have a moment, I'd like to point out that just over there is where some of the priests live inside these rustic caves. It sounds kind of romantic or adventurous, but... Having been invited to one for a meal, let me be the first to dispel the idea that they are much more than bare chilly rock on the cliff sides. And also, just up ahead is where the entrance to the Diviner Shell Cave is. Hmm. Thank you very much for uh, taking us, I appreciate it. Have you been inside of the cave? Oh no, it's dangerous. 
Didn't you hear me tell the story? I normally wouldn't go anywhere near there, it's not my kind of thing. And, you know, we're still maybe a few minutes walk, but I'll at least accompany you to the entrance. Maybe walking near the back, here, next to Nimble, while you tall folk lead the way. But, uh, can I ask, is there a reason you would like us to walk ahead of you? <laughs> Should we be expecting something, perhaps? If you've never gone to the cave because you think it's dangerous, why pick today to get a closer look? I mean, it's a bit curious, is it not? <laughs> I look up to the sky, I breathe in the salty seawater, and I turn to them, and I say, You three are very interesting. And I want to see what happens when you guys enter the cave. Whoa, before we <laughs> go any further, listen. Could you please just tell us, I... I don't know why, but I get the feeling that you can... You have some idea of what we are perhaps walking into. Could you give us some indication of what we might see? <laughs> so that we can be prepared, you know. RJ, your feeling is wrong. I'm just an observer. I like to see interesting things, not experience them. I will not be going in the cave. Have I not made this clear? It is Dangerous. Can I do a? Can I please? Uh, I, I, can I see, see if they, if you high is telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth in this moment, please? <laughs> you high would need to either roll a deception or persuasion roll, making sure not to tell anyone if she was telling the truth or not, unless Ajay exceeded the roll. Yeah, don't tell me which one it is. <laughs> that is a minus one, so it's eighteen. Nimble's very believing. <laughs> uh, Oh, Nimble. Oh, Nimble. <laughs> I got a 19. Uh, I can see that you don't quite believe me, so I'll come clean about it. As you may know, I like to collect stories. And I feel like the three of you, you might go on to do something interesting in the fabled Diviner Shell Cave of Legend. And if that happens, I would like to collect that story to share. I'm quite curious what you might learn, or if you even come back. It's not every day that the leaders of three communities come this far from home on a holy pilgrimage, right? So, I plan to lead you to the entrance and talk to you once you leave. That way, I can say I was there when the story happened. It lends credibility, but so much as there can be in such fable. Okay, what's the reason we want to go into this dangerous cave? Did something special happen there? <laughs> All right! <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot, Vin, you weren't there for the story! Uh, perhaps you might enlighten me, Yuhai, on, um, the whole cave situation. <laughs> In the myth, which I recited beautifully, a lovely Selkie died in the cave while trying to learn her heart's true desire because she felt so lost in her life. See, the Diviner Conch within the cave tells you the answer to your heart's true desire. In the tale, the Selkie became so overwhelmed by her emotions that she did not notice the water rushing into the cave, and so perished. So maybe that will be a warning for when you're inside, to not let your emotions get to you. I said before, it's too dangerous for someone small like me, or perhaps nimble. But it might be okay for you taller folk. I will have you know that nimble, while small, is very capable, so... Thank you. I, I do can. hope so, after the scene he caused at the pub. <laughs> that, yes, that was actually... You probably should have seen that, Nimble. I... Oh, come on, I already said sorry and paid that guy. And let's be honest, if anything, he walked into me. <laughs> so I'm kind of... You cannot pay your way out of every problem. Especially not this cave. Listen, Nimble, I appreciate you being willing to come with me. And you as well, Vin. But I do not want to put you in harm's way. Every time we hear something about this cave, it seems more and more dangerous, and perhaps I might not even go all the way in. I am just curious. There is something about this place which is calling to me, so I would not be offended if you do not want to risk your lives for what is essentially a gut feeling, or a hunch, on my part. Well, Ajay, I, um, I will say that... <clears throat> would you come over here for a moment. Thanks. So Yulhai wasn't exactly transparent with us from the beginning, so we don't really know if we can trust her or what's inside this cave. It, it, it might not be dangerous after all. That is an extremely optimistic way of looking at it. 
people <laughs> surrounding that we are in. <laughs> they, 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 I think, if anything, it's probably more dangerous. Well, <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. However, I'm a man of my word. And if you want to go in and find your heart's true desire, then I surely won't let you go in there alone, Ajay. We can face this together. What a hero I just swoon. Oh. <laughs> I, I honestly think that Ajay is going to try and figure out whether Vind is lying. Has Vind rolled a 17 for either persuasion or deception? I got a absolutely uh, gigantic, huge, walloping five. However, Vind could see the hesitation plain on Ajay's face. With a small smile, he extended his arm to grip the orc's wrist in a traditional handshake. You don't have to trust in these strange fables or dangerous rocks, but know that I am here for you, brother. <laughs> <coughs> and um, you should trust me anyway, seeing I... as though I rolled a much higher number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ajay looks down for a second and his brow furrows and he looks conflicted for a second and looks back up at you and he'll take your wrist and shake it and say I believe that you will try to keep me and Nimble safe but there are things that you must answer honestly when we are back on the willow I do not want to ruin this moment by bringing them up now and I want you to know that I sincerely appreciate your aid. I would just like to <sighs> yeah. quick say something here. <laughs> <laughs> I did not even see you. How did you cut? Like, where did you Nimble, come from? were you there the whole time? <laughs> uh, you have to understand, Nimble. I, you are so much smaller than I am, so I cannot... My eyeline is up here. I cannot see you. You have to give me some forewarning. Big steps. Big loud steps, please, next time. Big loud steps. <sighs> oh. I would just like to say something. You I know I'm small, and I know that I can maybe be distracted by all of this exciting stuff, but when it really comes down to it, this fling took down a giant. This knife took a fish as big as you are, and I have the support of my people to keep the Shady River safe. So I need you to give me the same benefit of the doubt. Do not take me for just a simple borough folk. In my village, we all work together. And even though we're small by your standards, we catch more, we accomplish more by working together. So I am here, same as you, miles and miles from my home, and I'm here to do good. We walk this path together, regardless of our height. Don't forget that, Aji. And I start walking. Having traveled with the carefree man for so long, Vin and Ajay realized that they had taken for granted that he was actually the Nimble Remble Trout Spine Trout, a name that was known throughout their respective homes as a warrior, hunter, and mediator. Ajay, in particular, only now connected these brave acts to the small form that walked ahead of him. The others followed Nimble, catching up in a few paces. I'm sorry, friend. I had forgotten your strength. It is my honor to have you join me in this hour. Thank you, Nick. Uh, no worries, IJ. Uh, sorry if I was too serious there for a moment. It is my honor to be taking this journey with you, too. So, let's do this. As bats swooped by overhead, Nimble simply nodded as he instinctively inspected the ground for tracks. But the hard rocks and puddles of seawater left nothing to be read. As they continued, a cliff face unexpectedly revealed itself from within the fog, a 300-foot drop presumably to rocks and salty waves below. A narrow ledge was the only indication of a path down, and down towards their destination. I'd like to use guidance. I would probably give it to RJ because he's the tallest and he can walk first. Ju shou zhi lao. I will take it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I feel I may need it, huh? For the next 60 seconds, Ajay was able to add a d4 to any one ability of his choice. So the next 60 seconds, I tried to do a backflip immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been able to do one. Be careful. The cliff face is very narrow. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Now's the best time. If I'm ever going to do a backflip on a cliff face, now is the time to do it. <laughs> Ajay reached within his cloak, removing what appeared to be the branch of a tree from its sling across his back. In a single forceful snap, he split the branch in half giving half to Yuahai and returning the other half to its place within his undercloak. If we do not emerge from the cave in time for the ritual, would you please present this to the Tide Altar as an offering for my people, the Sankuma, and ask that the Sunken One might bless our land? Yuahai stared at the branch in her hand. Hmm. Yes, I can do that. 
But may I ask what this is exactly? This is the branch of the Fosonia tree. It is a, an extremely old tree, the roots of which have been touched by all of my ancestors. It sits just above my home, the Mithraea of Sangoma, deep under the ground. And like our lungs, it pulls in breath. The great roots hold the living memories of the ones that live beneath them, the memories of our people. As such, it is a sacred being, and only small pieces of the Fosonia tree can be harvested and crafted into only the finest things related to our beliefs. The staff I carry, and Ajay holds out his hand and in it materializes a staff of this dull, knotted, dark, rich-looking wood with these kind of golden veins running through it, and he says, This was made from a fallen branch of the Fosonia tree, and it was carried by the spiritual leader of the Sangoma, me. This tree is very special to us, and I hope that the sunken one will see this branch from it as an offering of peace and a sign of respect. <clears throat> Vin would like to respectfully grab Ajay and pull him aside and have a quick conversation, if that's okay. <clears throat> uh, Ajay. <clears throat> what, what, what is it? This is an extremely valuable artifact that you brought all the way from Sangoma in hopes of offering it to better your people. You just handed it over to somebody you just met who's leading us to a cave of uh, uh, of mystery that she will not enter herself. Do you, do you understand what you're doing right now? I have still some of the branch so that when I emerge I can make the offering, but, but I am entering a cave, a very dangerous cave, which I might not emerge from. So I am merely making sure that, hopefully... Yuahai will honor our memory and make the offering for me. If she does not, then <laughs> what can I do? I will be dead anyway, and my ancestors... Well, maybe we can have a good laugh about it in the afterlife. Well, let, let me reassure you. I am... I, I am here for the same purpose. To, to better my people, and Perhaps I, you should leave something with Yuahai as well, <sighs> just in case you do not come out. There's no ounce of my being that would trust you high with anything that belongs to the Ancestry. Therefore, I'm letting you know one more time I've promised my people that I would come back with something that would better our communities. I'm not going to jeopardize that for anything, and it's extremely selfish for you to do so. We're in this together, as I repeatedly said. If the gods care enough to send plagues to our communities, they must surely be watching as we go through these trials. Just trust that when we go in there, we will come out. We will go home. And my goal is to just get these offerings to three temples to fix things. I'm strongly advising you not to trust Yulhai with something so valuable. Maybe it's the animal eye shine, the, the look of a fox or snake looking to steal something, or the weird scars on her arm she's so keen to hide, but I don't trust her. What'll you do if she just leaves? Yulhai's keen ears perked up. Her name had drawn her attention. She gives Vin the side eye. I do not need to trust Yuahai. It is up to Yuahai to trust herself. Whether she wants to do what is right or not, whether she does, it is none of my business. <laughs> I have not jeopardized my mission in any way, and if it is all the same to you, I am happy to get into this cave before the tide changes. Fine. We'll do as you wish. Just remember that I spoke against this if anything happens. Of course. I appreciate your counsel. That is the reason I broke it in half. <laughs> okay, you high. Congratulations. <laughs> Are you going to be at the ritual later? We can chit. We can see each other then. Yes. And I I take um, Ajay's branch close to my chest and hug it so I don't lose it. And I say, well, I'll do my best. And I hope you will be able to give the offering by yourself at the end of this. I hope you still come out of the cave alive, or at least two of you. And I sigh, I, um, Vin. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just flip my hair and I walk away. The cliff face and its path to the Diviner Shell Cave were very narrow, and during certain sections, Ajay had to slide sideways as antlers caused him to tilt in a precarious manner towards the waters below. The trio began roughly 300 feet above the waves, but by the time they reached the entrance to a cave, divine or not, they were a mere 15 feet above the rushing, pulsing water. 
The boiling, roiling white foam of the sea break reached even closer with each wave, crashing up within reach of Ajay's hand. The entrance, a natural hole within the black rock, was ten feet wide, yet incredibly tall, narrowing fifty feet up like an arrowhead. Beyond the opening, the cave was dark and unwelcoming, the walls and path curving after just a few feet, making any exterior light useless. Whatever laid wait, whatever part of a myth this cave held, be it a heart's true desire or simply death, could only be found within. I will go first, since it was my idea. You will also have a chance to run, if something unfriendly lurks within. I suggest that we go in height order, just to, um... Well, it is the most satisfying. As we enter the cave, every time we go around a corner or something, I'm going to whisper a little cantrip under my breath and leave a little floating orb behind us um, that we can potentially act as a guide to help us uh, on our way back out, should we need to. Hmm, interesting. And attuned as he is to the spiritual world, Ajay feels... Well, he can certainly feel something, a presence perhaps, but he's not going to say this to the others just yet. Instead, he's just going to run his hands down the stone as he goes and tries to get a better listen. A strange golden residue remained in Ajay's hands, even after his staff vanished into the darkness. And rubbing his hands together, he was able to form small glowing orbs of light in an instant. As Ajay, Vind, and Nimble walked deeper into the cave, they all came to realize that they were walking downward. Sometimes the rocks had sheared and appeared like natural steps. At other points, the slick, darkened stone sloped gently down. A small trickle of seawater flowed beside their feet, racing them down into the dark below. The whole of the cave echoed the rush of sea waves crashing outside its walls, and fresh seaweed yet hung from jagged protrusions. Ajay calmly came to a stop at a large drop-off ahead of him, illuminated by one of the golden glowing orbs, a sudden cliff that descended about nine or ten feet to a visible shelf of stone, the first of many. Such a drop was nothing for someone of Ajay's stature, and surely not the descendant of a subterranean people. But a sudden and terrifying realization came over them all simultaneously. This is another water cave. We're well beneath the waterline. I do not like this already. An athletics or acrobatics check was now required for those who attempt to navigate the uneven, slippery rocks, based on how their character might descend. A four again, really? Athletics for me. Eight. Ah, if only. Honestly, if only I could have an eight. Lights present, and with no shortage of experience climbing similar terrain, they each needed to roll a ten or higher. But perhaps the fear of being underwater, or the algae or barnacles underfoot, caused the men to misjudge their efforts. When they landed, they didn't land on the feet they'd intended to land on, but on the butts they were trying to save. Taking... Uh, ten. I rolled oh. quite high. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Ten? Ten bludgeoning damage. That's like... Uh, yeah, I rolled. <laughs> almost half my life. I rolled them reasonably well. Which could be justified in that the first ten-foot ledge was only the first drop of many. Ajay slipped, careening down toward the edge, and Vind, in an effort to help his friend, was similarly brought off balance and so tumbled. Nimble, who had attempted to quickly catch up with them to slow their descent, was unable to slow his own momentum as he crashed into them near the edge of the first cliff. The trio, spilling over and crashing from one ledge down to the next and the next, landed in ankle-deep water with a splash. Okay. This is not a good start. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, at least we hit the bottom. <laughs> Hopefully it can't get too much worse. Uh. That was quite unpleasant. I think now that we... Now, now that the breeze coming back to my lungs, I can really almost taste the salt and sulfur in the air. <coughs> oh, oh, damn it. You know what? I'm gonna heal us. I got a bit of magic in me, you know, I can cure some wounds, light wounds. So I <laughs> grab a bit of seaweed and whisper, This was our mistake. Please let us not die right at the beginning of this cave. 
Okay, so that's an eight for me. But Ajay seemed distracted, listening to what sounded like a very quiet whisper. The voice was not frightening. It sounded like someone, no, somewhere was trying to speak to him, and yet he could not discern word from wave. As he closed his eyes to try and hear it, he felt something very familiar. Someone was trying to give him something, something sought after, something so precious to him. But its words and whose voice he heard remained unrecognizable. Ajay, having had similar experiences in the past, knows that talking back is not normally the correct course. So trusting in this, at least for a moment, uh, will allow himself to be guided towards this voice. I feel connected to something in this cave, spiritually. I'm going to follow it, but perhaps you could keep an eye out around us, just in case I miss something. I have to give this my full attention, seek the source of it. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Follow your intuition. We have your back. Right, Nimble? Yeah. I get my fling, a Polish rock, and, I put, and I'm like... Looking around. Vind held his spear out in front of him, nervously looking through the darkness for danger while Nimble found himself distracted by the many black polished stones among his feet, brought in by the waves for as long as the cave had existed, perhaps. These stones were perfect and dark, like the eyes of a large fish, unblinking, expectant. I pick up one of the rocks and examine it. It was so strange to see such dark stone. All the stones of the Shade Hill River back home held colors so well. Red and brown and white were normal. Some even came in greens and yellows. But here was only a uniform depth that matched the eyes of the giant he killed so many years ago. Hmm. The indiscernible whispers grew deeper, fuller, but never louder as the group walked further into the cave. Before Ajay, half hidden in a wall of solid rock, a giant conch shell swirled, its opening facing Ajay and the rolling waters around his feet. The whispers themselves did not issue from the conch. In fact, the conch seemed to sap them up, quieting the voices as Ajay approached. It was lusterless, gray, and large, larger than any natural conch would grow, And for this, it seemed monstrous, if not divine, in origin. This had to be the shell from the myth. Of this, Ajay was sure. Now Ajay was met with a decision. Did he wish to know his heart's truest desire? Ajay kind of looks around himself and seems to be muttering uh, something. In Orc, he says, It is with your guidance that I have come this far and I hope that the decision that I am about to make is one that you all would have taken also together we go as one and I will step forward to the conch having hopefully garnered my ancestor's blessing Knowing that he could not remove the conch from the wall, as it had been there since time in memoriam, Ajay instead stepped and leaned closer. He strained, closed his eyes to hear what it ushered, whispered, what it wanted to say. The conch would only tell him the answer to his heart's truest desire, which did not include the question he had intended, wished, to ask. For even the best of intentions can be clouded by the heart. And as Ajay closed his eyes and remained motionless, time passed. Especially for those around him, deep within that underwater cave. A roar, foam, and water had sprayed in, the tide rising even faster. It began around Vin's ankles, for Nimble a little higher, and now around Vin's knees, and for Nimble his hips. Uh, so, Vin, the tide seems to be rising, and I'm not sure how long it will be safe for us to be here. Yes, I noticed that as well. Um, Ajay? Ajay? Uh, Vin, that doesn't seem to work. We're running out of time here. He's out of our reach right now, and we have to get him out of there. <laughs> Nimble, we are, um, we are quite deep in this cave, and we're, we're both a great deal smaller than Ajay. I don't think we could lift him in the best of conditions, much less out of here. <laughs> 
We could hardly get in, which was the easy part. And I think even if it were just the two of us, our odds of getting out are getting worse by the moment. He's in some kind of spiritual trance, surrounded by his ancestors. Uh, perhaps they led him here. So I'd like to believe that they'll keep him safe. But I seriously doubt they'll extend that kindness to us. We've both tried and failed to wake him up. It it's time we ask ourselves if we're comfortable leaving him in their care, in the hopes that he wakes up before the tide takes him away. Are you prepared to leave him, or do you want to continue to wait? Do you have a rope or something? I mean, I can start climbing first and maybe make it easier for us to get out once I'm up there. Ah, Ajay has rope. Here, I'll stay back for a few more minutes while you set it up. Before we get started though, Nimble, um, I forgot to ask, do you swim? Yeah. Okay, so worst case scenario, I can maybe grab him and swim out of here before the tides rise up too much. I don't know if I can do it. I'm not that strong of a swimmer. Nimble, I'm gonna write a message for him and climb with you. I thought I was maybe a bit braver. I'm gonna at least write a message with the spear on the rock in front of him, so, so when he comes to, he knows where we are. And I'm gonna write, we have left a rope to help you get back to the entrance. Run while you can. And Vin just realized that's a bit long-winded to chisel out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Vince, come on, this is no time for fancy stuff. Just go with run. Vin etches the word run and looks at Nimble, who's already securing the rope. Nimble, are you okay with this? Yeah, not exactly. I mean, yeah, I believe so. He was prepared for this. And by the looks of it, he's not alone there. He'll be okay. Please be okay. Nimble and Vind, choosing to leave while Ajay was so entranced, succeeded sanity saving throws. Hearing the calming voice of a leader like Vind, knowing that Ajay was responsible enough to not only make his own decisions, but to dig himself out of his own grave, Nimble was able to justify leaving, given that he would also be creating some way of easing the shaman's escape. Okay, finish this knot. Nimble continued moving, guided by his survival instincts, though his heart raced as waters rose. But within Ajay's mind, the world seemed very different. Ajay walked slowly, following a calming voice that echoed and danced. He didn't know if it was the voice of the conch, the selkie, or the one true thing that he desired to know. Either way, it filled the air in his lungs. It shone on the back of his eyelids, sat on the tip of his tongue. As he saw flashes of a creature, the body of a horse, the head and antlers of a stag that looked so similar to his own, the long tail of a jaguar, this creature walked and waited, observed, standing not only over hills and mountains, but also fields and forests, always just beyond a circle of mourners. Kion, the mourner, a saint of Jagarin, Ajay knew this. Jagarin was not a god his people followed, but this thing, the embodiment of nature, of the seasons, this creature he had seen, and his people had seen. It majestically strode through the forest, and sometimes it moved through the sky. A celestial, but also very real and tangible. A presence that he felt so comfortable with. And as Ajay rolled the sanity saving throw... That's a whopping four. He lost five minutes of his life on the material plane, pulled deeper into the trance, taking two stress damage as he learned that which had meant so much to him. The identity of his mother. And while Ajay explored the world of spirits, in the world of particulars, a skills challenge had begun. The waters rose around Vin Graveview. Having already scratched the word run into the rocks near the conch, he was forced to focus on his own life, his own survival. In the cave of rock and living sea, he trudged through the rising waters toward Nimble, making an athletics check. I have a 23. Then reached the far end of the cave rather quickly given that the water was already deeper near its only exit. Shockingly, he discovered just how much deeper it would be. The whole cavern rested at a slant, and he was already chest deep in the water by the time he reached its far end. He found purchase on a rock jutting out from the wall and pulled himself out from the water. Nimble, having rolled a 20 on acrobatics, had already jumped from stone to stone and, free of the water, had made progress up the first cliff. Vind, searching for familiar handholds, now required a roll for survival. Uh, sorry, a survival roll. 24. With the coordinated efforts of Vin's experience and Nimble's climbing skills, both men were able to make it higher up the slick cliff face. The final purchase was almost within their grasp. 19. This impressive teamwork saved Nimble in that very moment as one of the rocks used as a handhold just moments before blasted forward, spewing water from the newest hole in the cliff rock. 
Thankfully, Nimble was already past it. Ajay. Ajay. On the other side of the cave, within his mind, Ajay saw beautiful funerals and rites of death. And in every scene, this creature stood ever watchful in the distance, observant and respectful. She had more to tell him, but all at once he felt his ancestors hold his attention, and it felt like he'd fallen into a river. As he fell from his dreamlike state, in the far distance Ajay watched as people dressed in black robes pushed a reed boat out into the water. But as the scene faded, the river did not, and it was cold, icy, and he felt stone beneath his feet once more. Ajay could smell salt, taste it. He was in a cave. Water was rising. His friends were already beyond him further up. They left him there. A little lower than Ajay's eye line, the word run had been scratched into the tide-polished stone. He's in potential imminent danger, and I think snaps out of it as he starts to think of his people, the fact that he has a task here. This was like a selfish endeavor, and he needs to get out of here. Ajay kind of shake his head, turn and look at where they fell from, and there is like little specks, like almost like gold flakes, appear where they fell from, and the gold flecks start to be surrounded by shadow, and there appears to be almost like a humanoid form, extends a hand down towards Ajay. Ajay reaches a hand up out of the water, but even though he's some distance away from this creature, seemingly grabs hold of it and pulls, Ajay then appears in place of this creature as I'm going to use Misty Step to teleport myself up there. There we go, dirty 20. Ajay closed his eyes, and in a blink of smoke that was swallowed by the roiling sea spray, he appeared across the cave. He then stood on the thin shelf just beneath the wind as salty water rushed past him from various openings in the underground cave. Ajay will reach down and be like, oh, where's my... I swear I had a length We were of... going to throw it to you later! Ajay, we have your rope. We can toss it over and, and, and help you towards us. Do not worry about me. I am fine. Just use my rope to get the two of you out of here. Quit being stubborn and accept the help. Okay, here. And Vin uses all of his strength to anchor the rope before he heaves it as mightily as he can over to Ajay expecting it to land perfectly in his massive paws before pulling him up towards myself and Nimble. So near to winning the skills challenge, all Vint Gravy required was a strength check. I've rolled a one, plus one. Uh, I've got two. As Vind hoisted the rope back, preparing to throw it, please roll a d4. A one. Could you roll a percentage die? No reason. Ah, uh, yes. Well, it's either a ten or a... Nope, also a one. <laughs> Are you sure these dice you sent over aren't cursed or something? I swear to God, people are going to think I'm reading this. Um, uh, can you please lower the camera a little bit so we just have a screenshot for posterity? Thanks. Okay. As Vin hoisted the rope back and threw it, the rope's free end slashed Ajay across the face for two damage. Ah, that hits me in the eye! Oh, I'm so sorry, Ajay! I'm so sorry! But a loop in the body of the rope wrapped around Nimble's arm, and as Vin pulled with all his strength, Nimble was sent off the edge. What? He fell down into those dark waters, still attached by the rope. I told you not to worry about me. I was just trying to do what was right. The rope around Nimble's body tangled more with every sloshing wave. Nimble could feel it creeping closer and closer to his neck, coiled like the long fingers of a watery grave. Nimble was sinking in angry, turbulent water in which he could no longer stand. He could not hear the yelling in the cave over the dull echoes of rolling rocks and constrained waves. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I feel the rope, so I'm going to use that as my guide, you know. I'm going to use light of hand, trying to get the rope, grab it firmly, and pull myself up because I know on the other end's feet. <laughs> so, oh, come on, eight? Nimble attempted to follow the rope up to his friends above, the friends that could aid him, but as he pulled on the rope, he realized he was only making it tighter and tighter around himself, and he continued to sink into the water. Part of Nimble's consciousness disassociated, lost in his mind, in his thoughts, and he realized as his body thrashed that his foot had now lodged itself between two of the eroded stalagmites on the floor. Woof, boy. Uh, without hesitation, Ajay is going to swan dive into the water down below where Nimble fell, and I'm just going to make a dexterity roll to basically try and do as perfect a swan dive as I can to try and catch Nimble and follow the rope to its end, assuming that the two are still connected, and then once I find him, I want to pull him out as quickly as possible. 
12. Ajay dove headfirst into the icy water and, at first, was again surprised by the feel of salt water, the grit of it. It was not how water should feel on the skin, not in the woods, not back home. And as he dove, heroic intentions aside, Ajay had miscalculated the depth of the water and thus took four damage. Just because the three-foot-tall person was fully submerged below the water did not mean Ajay would be. Yep, that's fair. At this point, Vin watches Ajay jump in and realizes that this has very much become a life or death situation. Vin is, uh, unknown to his allies, a coward at heart, and tells himself that if he can just reach the top of the cave, get to the entrance as quickly as possible by himself, he can maybe do something that will help his friends when they join him up there. And rolling a 13 for the inevitable sanity saving throw. From where he stood, Vin was able to reach a safe point near the mouth of the cave, but with every inch, his inner thoughts cursed and hissed at him, causing ten stress damage. It surprised Vin to feel this way, the guilt and stress of leaving Nimble and Ajay behind, and as Vin stood atop the first cliff, watching water pour in with every wave, staring down to the dark pitch of the cave below, guilt consumed him. Uh, so I try to take my fish dagger and cut some of the rope that's strangling me free with a... come on. Mine. Well, I've been worse. <laughs> Realizing that he's made an impulsive decision to save his friend and that very likely it will cost them their lives, Ajay is going to simply close his eyes and, with his ancestors, reach out with his mind on the sunken one, Neldich. He hopes that his prayer, a genuine one, will offer some calming touch to the waves and give them a small break in the churning water that they'll need to get out. Ajay could roll a religion check. That's 20. Vind looked down into the crashing waves below as ever-flowing water poured over his feet and funneled down into the diviner shell cave. His friends had vanished, and now, for the briefest of moments, the waves behind him calmed and the waters below ceased their suscitation. From the settling darkness, a large hand burst from the water's surface and Ajay grasped for the sharp rocks. The half-orc shaman climbed out from the calming waters. Under one arm, carried like a barrel of precious wine, was nimble. Ajay climbed up further and further, reaching the edge of the rock shelf Vind stood upon. He reached out his free hand for Vind, exhausted, breathless. So all Ajay needs is a hand, an assisting hand, to be brought up to land. Vind, please. A curious expression crossed Vind's face, one that was unfamiliar to Ajay. What was it you said earlier? That you'd bring justice and avenge the fallen? This is for the good of my people! And Vin pulls back his hand and strikes Ajay in the Ah! face with the back of the spear, casting him and Nimble down to the depths of the void where the rapids will claim their bodies and souls. I'm sorry! And beyond hurt, but knowing that this is the only way he can better his people, Vin watches the splash, watches the waters return to turbulent tides, mumbles a silent prayer and briskly departs before this place can claim a third victim. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 6, Betrayal. Created by Travis Vengroff and K.A. Stats. Starring Jasper William Cartwright as Ajay Ogun, Florian Zeitler as Yara Driftwood, Enrique Perez as Convo, Danilo Barascini as Nimbarembol Troutspine Trout, Sophie Yang as Quinn Lan, Eric Nelson as Vin Graveview, Lily Pichu as Viviana Bloodchamber, Sam Yao as Yuahai, and Kate Stats and Travis Vengroff as co-dungeon masters. Also featuring the voices of Beth Iyer, Kara Baxendale, Jack Fallahi, Ned Donovan, and Paul Foxcroft. This episode was produced and edited with sound design by Travis Vengroff, mixed and mastered by Dane Leonardson. Transcriptions by Shian Francois, and executive producers AJ Punkin, Michael Viegas, Dennis Greenhill, and Carol Vengroff. This episode features music by Brandon Boone, David Wise, Stephen Malin, Hitoshi Sakamoto, and Travis Fengroff. To see the paper that Yara picked up, for early access to adventures, and to support this show, please visit patreon.com slash foolandscholar. There are still a few spaces available to join us at D&D in a Castle in November, and please check out our new book, Unnatural Horrors, launching soon on Kickstarter. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening. The event that unfolded before Ajay's salt-stung eyes played over and over in his mind in waves as he fell. First, Ajay took 30 stress damage, but this would only matter if he survived. With the luck of his previous role denying him an instant painless death, 
Ajay, guided by more than what could physically be seen, felt as though the current pulling him down had somehow spared him from the most jagged of rocks. Ajay briefly left his body, or else imagined himself in his mind's eye playing back what had just happened. He reached out a hand, hoping that what was earlier such an anxious feeling of friendship was real. But as Vind turned his back, as Ajay fell and watched the golden-haired elf walk away, run away, flee away from the choice he made, Ajay was sure it was not the first time the coward had made such a choice. Underwater, out of body, Ajay now required a wisdom saving throw to avoid drowning. Failure would mean death. Oh, seventeen. But Ajay was Sangoma. He was half orc and half something divine. He was strong. And with the hand that once sought assistance, Ajay realized he did not need anyone's help. He had himself and the strength of his ancestors that dwelled within him. Ajay clenched a fist down upon slippery, sharp stones, digging nails in so far that they cracked, putting weight upon callous skin so hard it bled, fighting the currents, getting his head above water. With great effort, Ajay pulled himself up with one arm, still hoisting nimble. When they reached the entrance, now crashed over by water, Vind was already long gone, climbing just far enough out of the way so that the waves no longer crashed upon him or Nimble. Ajay rolled him on the stone and recognized that Nimble was no longer breathing. Nimble! Nimble, wake up! Nimble! Gods! Oh. <laughs> oh, Nimble, I beseech you return to this body! Nimble! The rope was wrapped around Nimble's throat and body, Nimble. and without the stress of rising tides, it was clear that his neck rested in an unnatural position. <laughs> Snapped. He must have died during the fall. But it was unclear if he had died before or after Aja went back to rescue him. <laughs> I have a dagger. I'll cut the rope off um, from around his neck and um, like some sort of medicine check if there's any way that I can stabilize him because that's the only thing that I can do uh, I'll try my best Ajay rolled him on the stone and recognized that Nimble was no longer breathing (laughs) no gods or creatures of the world could stop (gasps) Ajay in that moment from trying to bring back the light to Nimble's eyes Ajay worked quickly, removing the rope from Nimble's neck. He tried to reorient his neck into a natural position and pressed on Nimble's chest as he'd seen others do in an attempt to expel water. But nothing seemed to work. Even drawing the water out of Nimble's lungs with magic, there was no life, no spark, no joy left in his eyes. Ajay worked to cut the rope which had tangled around the halfling's arms, holding the small man in his arms as he worked. As Ajay untangled a hand, he saw something curious in his friend's grip. The knife that Nimble had used throughout his life for fishing and hunting, and what he had turned to in his last moments. Ajay succeeded a sanity saving throw, gaining only eleven stress as he continued these efforts. I... I've heard many stories of you. Your great deeds and... I'm so sorry, Nimble. It should have never happened. I would like to ask you if... If you would maybe in some way accompany me and my ancestors on this journey before us. I can hear them. I can hear them and they guide me. And I would welcome you as an advisor. And I'll place a hand um, uh, on Nimble's forehead and invite my ancestors to also place their hands on Nimble to see if we can give the gift of our people, the gift of the Forsonia tree to Nimble so that he can... um, Oh! (laughs) Um... So even if he cannot speak to me directly, then perhaps Nimble might be able to speak to his family or ancestors of the past, just so that he's not alone in death. 
I have done this more times than I would like to admit. Fallen friends, it is a shame that you did not fall in a hunt or in a battle against a great beast, but perhaps in your beliefs in nature God will honor you through the deeds of your life and not the circumstances of your passing. If only all of us could have such kindness. Nimble, I will ensure that everyone knows exactly what you did and who you were. I hope that a small part of you will come on this journey with me. <laughs> I... Please do not be angry, but I am going to take this, the vial of water you carried. I intend to give it as an offering for your village. I believe that you would have wanted this, and... I know it is not really your style, but I'm... It's kind of mine, so I'm going to take this dagger. And I will use it to avenge you. The last thing that Vind Grave you will see is this dagger, I promise you. <sighs> he has taken so much from me. I don't know if you remember, but he called this pilgrimage one of penance. And his actions today have confirmed my suspicions that he poisoned his brother to take his place as leader. He has undoubtedly lied about much. Killed others, perhaps. And I vow today that yours will be the last life he takes. Neldich, I beseech you take this gift, the last remaining part of the Fosonia tree that I have, as payment for my short-lived but dear friend, Nimble. Know of his bravery. Please. Neldich, this is what I ask of you. That you carry his brave soul on one last journey. May my friend be one with the waves until he is made whole by being one with his family. With that, Ajay will attach the remaining part of the Forsonia branch to Nimble's body and gently lower that body into the water with the hope that Neljeech will find a way to deliver this message back to his family that they may know what happened. <sighs> Thank you, Ajay. Ajay stood to his full height for the first time in a long time, his face blank and emotionless. Unsure if he truly heard the voice of his friend rolling in the waves. And then the waves crashed once more. And what Ajay heard of him and saw of him vanished beneath him. Gripping the fishing knife in one hand, Ajay's thoughts shifted from mourning and seas to his patron god, the hunter, Ultigan. And as the sound of a marine bell rung out in the distance, his grip tightened and he began to stride toward the temple. The observance of last light would soon begin.